six foot tabletop. As we find out who walks the walk, it's the bane of our existence to practice social distance. Six foot tabletop. Hello and welcome to Six Foot Table Talk, a series bringing civil discourse and understanding back to the table. My name is Nigel Eastman and I am honored to be your host, but this series is not about me. This series is about the conversation. So let the talk begin. Good evening. I'm Jim Parker of First United Methodist Church Plano. And my guest tonight is Sam Hodges of United Methodist News Service. Tonight we'll be talking about freedom of the press, our country and in our faith journey. The book of John states, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. The United States Constitution establishes freedom of the press for both secular and religious publications in the First Amendment, along with protecting both speech and the right of assembly. Sam, are there any legal restrictions uh, for a reporter on information he or she presents? Well, first, Jim, let me say that I appreciate the invitation to be with you. And uh, I was asked specifically by Judith Reedy of the pastoral staff here, and she used to be my pastor, so I do almost everything she tells me to do. So you here I am. Um, well, truth is a great defense. And uh, so when a news organization is reporting the truth, uh, it has great leeway to do that. There are uh, instances of national security where uh, news organizations think long and hard about what to report. But in general, uh, news organizations have a lot of freedom to report accurately. Uh, in the case of public officials, news organizations can legally report inaccurately as long as there was no malice in doing so. Now, that was, there was an important case, Times versus Sullivan, uh, in the 1960s that established that principle. Now, in reporting on individuals who are not really public figures, uh, libel laws come into play, and it's important to uh, be as accurate as possible. Uh, but here in the United States, we enjoy considerable press freedom. Um, interestingly enough, there, there are organizations that evaluate all countries for Freedom of the Press in the United States ranks about 40th in those in those areas. There are countries that have greater transparency, greater access to public officials and documents than the United States, and less harassment of people in the press. So, while we enjoy considerable freedom of the press, we are we are not the number one nation in that regard. And these same organizations report that. Um, only about 15% of the world's population lives in a country that enjoys freedom of the press. So. Well, we hear the, uh, the phrase often about fake news. What is the difference in credible news and fake news? Well, I suppose there's some subjectivity in that, but um, in my mind, news that is reported uh, accurately, that has sources for it, be they individuals who know what they're talking about or documentation, um, that, that is not fake news. Um, I think where it gets to be a gray area is where um, reporting uh, engages in what might be called informed speculation and um, kind of pushes the boundaries of, of whether something really constitutes a story uh, maybe it has sources, but the real question is whether whether the article or piece should have been done, uh, whether it was wise to to speculate, even if you've got sources willing to speculate with you about a certain subject. Well, even in, in secular publication or in religious publications, how difficult is fact-checking? Well, uh, it's easier than it was when I started out, pre-internet. I mean, basic things like checking people's names and addresses and ages and finding sources is helped by the internet a good bit. Uh, and I do interviews on the phone and 
through email and through Facebook and just about any way I can do them. And, and so there are advantages to, to the period we're living in in terms of gathering information and checking facts. Uh, but it can still be difficult, and governments sometimes make it difficult uh, by making important documents uh, hard to get, charging the public, including the press, or copies of documents, going to the courts to say that documents should not be available or meetings should be closed. Uh, so I don't want to suggest that uh, it's a great time or a carefree time in terms of gathering information and, and, and checking facts. Well, it's interesting that freedom of religion and freedom of assembly are considered right in that First Amendment, right with the uh, freedom of speech and the press. Do you think that means that the right to publish is in the press or media is a, as important as the other two? Well, I do think it is because, um, especially in terms of the Christian faith, we're called on to uh, speak to the issues of the day. Uh, I believe it was the German theologian Karl Barth who said that a preacher should have a Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. <laughs> and certainly United Methodist Church has social principles, uh, stands on uh, immigration, on anti-discrimination, on health care, on any range of social issues. And to be effective in working for positive change regarding those issues, it's important to be informed. And to be informed well, we need a free press and a robust free press. So I think exercise of religion and free press go hand in hand. Well, how do they protect the press from censorship? Well, uh, I think many states have followed the lead of the First Amendment uh, and the federal government to a large degree has followed the lead of the First Amendment in opening meetings and making records available. We have a Federal Freedom of Information Act, which is open not just to the press, but to any interested party. And a lot of important authors draw importantly on the Freedom of Information Act. Um, there are what are called sunshine laws, which guarantee transparency in government to, to some degree. Uh, so we operate in a pretty good environment, but I would point to the ways in which those are, those are circumvented. If you have any experience with the Freedom of Information Act, and I do, you'll often wait a long time to get the results back, get the documents you're seeking, and often there'll be a lot of things redacted or marked out. Uh, if you covered school boards in Texas, as I have, um, you will find that they have executive session meetings where fairly obviously a lot of things were decided behind closed doors and they come out and vote unanimously with little debate about the decisions that were made. So um, I don't want to overestimate or overstate the problem, but I don't want to understate it either. It can be difficult to, to, to get at the truth even in, a, in, even in a country that has First Amendment and state laws uh, that protect press freedom. Well, during my time when I was doing service in the Army in Heidelberg, Germany, I had the opportunity to talk to some of the, the students, the German students that were going to the university there. And one of the things I asked them was, how in the world did Hitler and, and the Nazis take over the country? And they would answer me, they control the press. And that's that happens in a lot of countries, happens in a lot. Of, and uh, I wonder how you, how you felt about that. Well, and, are, and are there other countries in the, in the world today that have a similar situation? I'm not aware of a situation as sinister as that of, of Nazi Germany, but clearly China is a place where um, freedom of the press, freedom of speech are not allowed. And, uh, and there are other countries that are progressive in some ways, but not in that way. Cuba has, has great public health care and education, but it puts people in jail for criticizing the government. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, really the majority of people in the, in the world don't enjoy the kind of 
press, press freedom that we do. And absent of press freedom, people end up in jail. Uh, ideas that are important to come to the forefront don't. Uh, governments tend to be author authoritarian. And while they may not be uh, as bad as the Nazis were, it uh, may in some ways be good. They're still, um, they're still missing the free exchange of ideas and, and, and just the personal freedom and the press freedom that I think is necessary for a country to come close to flourish. Well, I agree. And I think that today in our society, with the internet and Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, the, the, the print work, the newspapers, seem to be declining. Is that true? Well, it's absolutely true. It's, um, it's, it's a story that has its complications. Uh, I think uh, it's clear that the New York Times is reaching more people than ever. Uh, the Wall Street Journal is another newspaper like the Times that when you combine print and online circulation is, is doing quite well. The Washington Post is now owned by Jeff Bezos, who owns Amazon, so it has the deepest possible pockets and is, is also doing very well um, in combined circulation and reach. So there's that, but regional newspapers such as the Dallas Morning News, uh, smaller town newspapers, uh, weekly newspapers in the smallest communities, those are really under great stress, uh, financial stress. The, uh, the pillars of income that they depended on, circulation, uh, classified advertising, and retail advertising have, to a distressing degree, gone to the internet and left them having to cut staff, and it becomes a circular problem because when you have fewer people, you're able to gather less news and be yeah. as interesting as you were before, as compelling. So when I worked at the Dallas Morning News before I started working full-time covering the United Methodist Church, we had a much bigger staff than the Dallas Morning News has now. And beats that we had reporters on, the paper can't afford to have those beats because the, the revenue source just isn't there. So um, it's important uh, not only to have freedom of the press, but to have um, the financial backing for news gathering. And, and that's a very spotty picture these days and troubling in some contexts, including even cities as large as Dallas that are growing, having fewer boots on the ground reporters covering the news. Well, in the print media, in the book business, I spent 20 years running a bookstore, and I, I can tell you that books are just exactly like newspapers. They're beginning to slow down as far as print media, because most of them you can get off of Amazon, and you can get electronically. Uh, I saw that as, you know, when you're used to reading out of a book, and you start out in school reading out of a book, and it's a habit, and you go to it, it's, it's hard to get on a Kindle, although it's, much, it's very easy to read on. But I, I felt that the also the hard the print and the hardback books were disappearing also. Well, I, I still subscribe to the Dallas Morning News yeah. uh, and the New York so, Times. We so. get we get them thrown in our yard every morning, and I think the experience of reading a print paper is different. I mean, you're turning a page, and someone has um, selected articles of interest. And it's um, possible, it happens to me virtually every day, that I come across some subject I didn't know I'd be interested in, but I'm grabbed by that. And while the Internet has wonderful advantages in terms of uh, communicating the news and being able to update the news and, and uh, provide all sorts of uh, interactive, interactive possibilities, um, I, I worry that it's too much information. Um, it's, it just kind of comes at you so fast and furiously that it's hard to step back and have any perspective or context. And that it, it, it just um, tends to lead toward people reading the things that they know they're interested in and not maybe discovering a new interests and, and new concerns from the news. 
in the way that, that I do turning the page of a newspaper. So there are definitely trade-offs, and I'm concerned about some of those. Well, I, and I'm like you. I spread my paper on the coffee table in the morning and a cup of coffee, and I'm ready to go through the whole thing. And, you know, whether it's the, the, the local news, sports, or whatever, I want to get in there and, really, and read it. But my daughters, they don't subscribe to newspapers. They read on their, you know, they're just in the Internet. So well, it's a different... It's a definitely a, a generational thing, and, and I don't think there's any going back in a significant way. But newspapers and print still account for a significant amount of the revenue uh, at a place like the Dallas Morning News. So I, I think uh, they're going to be around for a while, and I think they will continue to, to, to make a positive difference um, reaching readers that way. But... Um, we, we definitely entered into the internet dominant era. Yes, I agree. But whatever the type of, of press, whatever type of news that is, you know, that we can read and feel in, 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 in our daily lives, uh, both in, in our religious beliefs, they all depend on the freedom of the press. And that can't be limited without being lost. I agree completely. Um, and I would just emphasize that it takes both things. It takes freedom of the press and it takes us um, finding financial resources to support news organizations. And that's where I think we're in a kind of shaking out period. Um, I mentioned earlier that some beats that the Dallas Morning News used to cover, it's not able to afford to cover anymore. And one of those is religion. I mean, I, I was a full-time religion reporter for the Dallas Morning News and I knew I knew the Catholic bishop, and I knew the, the rabbis of the largest uh, synagogues, and I knew Chris the well. church pastors. I knew Chris Will. I didn't know him. He had passed on, but I knew his successors and and uh, and knew kind of the gamut of the religious leaders and institutions. And uh, we had a when I started the Dallas Morning News in 2005, uh, we had a separate religion section with two reporters and an editor assistant editor, and that faded to a um, smaller section, and then that section was eliminated, and I was, my stories were appearing in the metro section, and then that beat was eliminated during retrenchment. It was nobody's fault, but, um, but, but something that the paper had to make hard decisions about which beats to eliminate, and religion got eliminated, and I ended up covering public schools uh, out in Collin County here, so... Um, it takes freedom of the press, but it takes um, it takes the financial resources. One encouraging trend has been uh, nonprofit organizations that, that go to foundations and individual donors and put on conferences and raise money in different ways to uh, to provide reporting staff. So here in Texas, the Texas Tribune has been uh, one of those that has led the way. Uh, in showing that, that it's possible to, to pull together a, a strong reporting staff and support it um, differently than the old model of advertising. And uh, ProPublica nationally is, is one that has won some future prizes for its reporting, and it too leans on foundations and individual donations. Um, different model, working pretty well. Uh, unfortunately, a, a small town whose newspaper goes out of business is unlikely to get help from an organization like that. So, so there are plenty of gaps emerging in news coverage. And even the, the term uh, news deserts, uh, yeah. like food deserts in some areas, which seems incredible because we have so much news coming at us on our phones and everywhere else, it seems. But really, they're, they're, they're communities that don't have anybody going to the city council anymore. County Commission and uh, covering the courts locally, and and that's a very worrisome trend. Do you think that it, the reason religious uh, press has has gone down some is, is there not enough uh, news coming out of religions as it were, say, forty years, fifty years ago? I don't think that's it. I, I'm aware of, of I, what I would say were important religious stories in Dallas that haven't been covered for lack of somebody on that beat. I think the stories are there. I think it's it's more a matter of, of resources and, and commitment. Um, 
you know, it is true that denominations are in a struggling place right now. Uh, not just the United Methodist Church, but really yes. all denominations. Uh, and we are becoming, I think, I think the data shows this, uh, a more secular society. Yes. Um, but uh, there are a lot of people who are very interested in, in the religious life of this country, and it's, it's clearly still absolutely material to to American life and, and has an influence on government as well. Um, and so um, I think it, it continues to be a crucial beat, and I'm sorry that there aren't more people on that beat like that. I know when I grew up here in, in Dallas, there were three major religions that were in the Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish. And uh, now there are many, many other religions that have come from other countries into this country and that have a presence and are in the news. It's absolutely true. Um, Dallas is a diverse city, ever more so, and with that comes religious diversity. Right. And, and that means large representations of Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims. Um, it's the, the whole gamut is here. And it's an important part of the picture, and the interface relationships are important to that as well. So uh, I think the religion section that the Dallas Morning News had for many years did a good job of explaining some of these religions to people who, who hadn't encountered them before. And so I'm, I'm sorry that we're not getting more of that kind of coverage. We need it. I know with the technical companies here in this area, you had more and more people moving into the office that you didn't recognize their religion. And, and unless you knew something about them, whether they were Hindu or Muslim or whatever, you probably made a mistake in talking to them. And so you, it, yeah, I think it's great that, you, that there are some periodicals that do kind of fill you in on the different religions that have moved in. No, I agree, and I, I think that's important you know, a lot of the, uh, the religions and denominations within mainline Christianity will have something like the news organization I work for, United Methodist News Service, which is focused on a particular church. Um, but even those have struggled uh, along with the denominations. I mean, uh, it's, it's harder to find funding to support that kind of uh, focused journalism. And I think some of the religions that have gotten a foothold and more than that here in the metro area don't have really ever had that kind of coverage for themselves. And um, so I, I think it's, um, that's, that's an aspect of where we are that's, that, that I can't give a good grade to. Um, there's a, a, a good organization, a news organization called Religious News Service, uh, which attempts to cover kind of across the spectrum. And some of the very biggest newspapers have religion reporters still, but um, there are just not as many people paid to cover religion as, as, as was the case even a decade ago, or certainly a generation. Six foot table talk, as we find out who walks the walk.